Imagine, if you will, an evil, corrupted druid who hates everything that he once loved and covets that which he truly can't have. And then combine that with the size of a dragon, and you have our friend the green dragon. The green dragon is truly a nasty, nasty creature. When you speak of the true chromatic dragons, the green dragon, though lawful evil, is a very corrupt and vicious, plotting, manipulative creature. Not quite the narcissist that a blue dragon is, but definitely a schemer and a plotter who delights in the suffering of those who he doesn't like. Um, and, and the green dragon description in fifth edition is very precise. It makes them stand out quite a bit. Um, to my mind, uh, the green dragon as envisioned in this version is almost like a fierce dinosaur with wings and intellect. Um, and in a lot of ways has the sort of hatefulness that you would come to expect in evil dragons. But let's delve a little bit into some of the descriptive elements. Um, the most cunning and treacherous of true dragons, green dragons use misdirection and trickery to get the upper hand against their enemies. Nasty tempered and thoroughly evil, they take special pleasure in subverting and corrupting the good hearted. In the ancient forests they roam, green dragons demonstrate an aggression that is often less about territory than it is about gaining power and wealth with as little effort as possible. So that harkens back to what I was talking about, the manipulative component, right? Um, and I just think of, of them as, when, the, when I think of the green dragon, I think of cruel. It's like a cruelty kind of evil, you know? Breaking away from simple alignment descriptions, you have to think about the green dragon at whatever age in its native structure. And that is to say like, it's manipulative, it's cruel. Um, it delights in the suffering of, of especially elves. Um, and, and I think that you also have to think about their typical locale. So green dragons tend to live in forests. Now, when you think of the age of a green dragon and where you want to place it in your world, I mean, that's many of the D&D worlds have wide swaths of forests. So the green dragon could be encountered frequently throughout the period of a campaign at different levels. Um, certainly, as I've given you examples of with other dragons, at lower levels, you could have wormlings, green dragon wormlings, who encounter the party. At mid-levels, you could do young green dragons. At higher levels, adult or even ancient at the highest levels. But let's think about more so than just here's a monster who spits po horrible poison at its victims. Let's think about the, the intent of the green dragon. What does it want? What are its motivations? Why are you using a green dragon in your campaign or just for an adventure? Why are you throwing a green dragon into an encounter and how can we expand on that? Um, capricious hunters. A green dragon hunts by patrolling its forest territory from the air and the ground. It eats any creature it can see and will consume shrubs and small trees when hungry enough, but it, its favorite prey is elves. So many of the classic D&D campaign settings um, elves are, are the bastions and protectors of nature. Often elvish uh, or elven communities are centered around, you know, broad ancient forests. And there's, there's so many ways that you could have a party in your game be moving through on their way from one place to another and have to encounter a dragon at whatever age and size. Um, but you could definitely design an adventure where they are actually going into a forested area for a very specific reason. And if you're clever, you can tie that in with your characters. So I want you to stop and think for a moment about a game that you have going on now, or maybe one that you're planning. Think about if any of your players are playing wood elves, as an example. But we could even stretch it to other elves. 
We could stretch it to forest gnomes, basically humans, any of the major player races that might be from a homeland that's a forested area. Now, you can connect this green dragon encounter or even on a broader adventure level or even throughout your whole campaign by considering the importance of your player's character's homeland and the defense of that homeland against the scourge of a green dragon. And I think that itself plants many, many seeds for you to create adventure opportunities using the green dragons. So as an example, let's say that Bob the elf and um, Sheena the forest gnome um, are part of your party. And they have both, you know, they both come from the great forest of Shabazaba. And um, the great forest of Shabazaba has long been a sanctuary of good and many good creatures live there. There's uh, pegasi and unicorns and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. So, but you know, maybe they, after an adventure, are on their way back to the homeland. They've decided to bring their other friends you know, with them to celebrate their most recent adventure. And they come across rumors of um, parts of the wooded areas, like the, the natural animals that live there have mysteriously gone missing. You know, so create a little bit of foreshadowing, a little bit of mystery. And then maybe they go to investigate on behalf of one of the, you know, uh, forest gnome shamans or a druid or a, you know, chieftain. Any, any number, elf, forest gnome, druids, whatever. Some ally who's like, you know, hey, something very strange has happened. You know, a group of our scouts was out in the western verge of the forest and they you know, they've disappeared. They haven't reported back in three days. So you, you plant this adventure seed. They go to investigate, and now, you know, they start finding these clues that things aren't quite right. Maybe they find, like, you know, a swath of, like, broken younger trees and branches from larger trees that have just been destroyed. And they find, like, body parts and, like, armor and weapons from the scouting party, but no, you know, not much more than that, just some gore. Um, because the green dragon ate everybody. Um, so, you know, you could start planting these seeds, right? And they haven't even encountered the dragon. They're just kind of coming across the wreckage. Now, here's an interesting thing that you could throw into your mix. This could be a simple encounter that continues to kind of foreshadow the dread of the green dragon. And that is manipulative schemers. A wily and subtle creature, a green dragon bends other creatures to its will by assessing and playing off their deepest desires. Any creature foolish enough to attempt to subdue a green dragon eventually realizes that the creature is only pretending to serve while it assesses its would-be master. When manipulating other creatures, green dragons are honey-tongued, smooth, and sophisticated. Among their own kind, they're loud, crass, and rude, especially when dealing with dragons of the same age and status. So I could see this as being a situation where you know, a green dragon has kind of moved into this area, slaughtered this scouting party, and has now maybe found a very fearful um, druid or an elf resident or forest gnome resident of the area who it has manipulated into being its kind of information source, right? And maybe your party, as they're exploring the missing scouting party, comes across this quote-unquote survivor who tells them about this fearsome green dragon and warns them, right? Your party's most likely not going to assume right off the bat that this person, this survivor, whatever he or she is, um, is like, you know, has been manipulated by the green dragon. They're gonna take most of the words at face value. But let's say you have a very experienced party and somebody is like, I'm, I'm gonna make a inspiration or a insight roll you know, to see if this person's telling the truth. If they succeed, you could, you could tell your players, like, you get the sense that this person's not being entirely truthful. And if they press or interrogate the person, maybe the person reveals that the green dragon has, like, told them that if they don't, you know, serve him, he will, like, eat everyone in his family and destroy his village. But if they don't bother to do that, then they're going to assume that this person's telling the truth. And you can use that NPC survivor as a proxy for your green dragon, as the green dragon would. It's manipulated this person to misdirect and deceive members of the party. 
And maybe the dragon feeds this NPC, you know, little bits of misinformation to get the party to go to another place and defeat some of its enemies that it doesn't want to defeat so that it can swoop in and get the treasure. Maybe it wants to misdirect the party to give information or misinformation or falsehoods to like the village elders or the druid council so that they in turn do the wrong things, allowing the green dragon to strike when they're most vulnerable. So there are a lot of different ways that you could take a couple little encounters like that and make it a new adventures. Now, how do you stretch this into whole campaigns? The same kind of concepts where you're planting the seeds and foreshadowing things, but just on a different scale. So maybe the party successfully after a series of adventures defeats this green dragon. And now, you know, they've kind of moved on to another area, but they've come to find that that green dragon had a brood of, you know, four wormlings. And those wormlings now might try to attack or, you know, manipulate others into doing their bidding. Those small wormlings might not be a threat to a mid-level or high-level party. But maybe the other mate of that dragon who they defeated comes with the wormlings, right? And now they're just wreaking havoc in the area. And, you know, the party's kind of dealing with this conflict bubbling over into neighboring areas. Uh, in the Monster Manual, they even talk about what happens when green dragons intersect in territory with other dragons. Um, and I think the example they give is, you know, sometimes a green dragon might um, butt heads with uh, a black dragon in marshy woods or with white dragons in a subarctic uh, sub area. And that's another way to expand your interactions with dragons in your living world that you're running, whether it's a homebrew setting or Forgotten Realms or whatever it is, you know, think about the fact that there are other people, other factions, other dragons doing things at the same time as your party is adventuring. And while your party is adventuring, gaining levels, those dragons, those NPCs, those other factions are also always doing stuff. And it's a lot to keep track of, but it makes for a more rich, uh, kind of immersive environment when it's not like a video game where like the party's here and everything else around them is just on freeze. You have things going on all the time. I want to talk about uh, Dragon's Lair, the, dra the Green Dragon's Lair, because when I read this, it made me think of powers of like a, an immensely powerful druid. And in fact, when you think about it, the, dr the Green Dragon, once it's made its lair, and, and connected with the magic in that area, it can do amazing, powerful things. Some of the lair actions, I think, are crazy powerful. Some of them are kind of organic and make sense given the circumstances, but um, grasping roots and vines erupt in a 20-foot radius centered on a point on the ground that the dragon can see within 120 feet of it. That area becomes difficult terrain, and each creature there must succeed in a DC 15 strength save or be restrained. A wall of tangled brush bristling with thorns springs into existence on a solid surface within 120 feet of the dragon. The wall is up to 60 feet long, 10 feet high, and 5 feet thick, and it blocks line of sight. When the wall appears, each creature in the area must make a DC 15 dex save. If they fail, pain and suffering and damage. The last one's kind of cool. Magical fog billows around one creature the dragon can see within 120 feet of it. The creature must succeed in a DC 15 wisdom save or be charmed by the dragon until initiative count 20 on the next round. That's just a thing that you could, you could do as well that's not necessarily combat but would allow the dragon to manipulate people to do certain things, right, while they're venturing into the lair. Now, I will say that these lair actions tend to be more realistically implemented with powerful older dragons. So maybe this is for your high level stuff, but when I think of, you know, encountering green dragons along the way during a campaign, when you get to that high level point and the party can't just, you know, ignore this festering problem of, of cruelty and destruction that goes on in their once pure forest homeland, now they have to go to the lair and face the dragon on the dragon's home turf. These are the kind of things that could present really cool challenges uh, before they even really get to the dragon or get a chance to attack the dragon. Regional effects. Um, and this, this is not only a regional effect in the sense, but 
It also helps you as a DM come up with really descriptive ideas um, when, you're, when you're kind of laying out the setting as the party's moving towards the area, the region where this dragon has now nested and, and occupied space and connected with the na natural forces there. Thickets form labyrinthine passages within one mile of the dragon's lair. The thickets act as a 10 foot high, 10 foot thick wall that blocks line of sight. Creatures can move through the thickets with every one foot a creature moves, costing it four feet of movement. A creature in the thickets must make a DC 15 deck save once each round in its contact with the thickets or take piercing damage from thorns. Within one mile of its lair, the dragon leaves no physical evidence of its passage unless it wishes to. Tracking it there is impossible except by magical means. In addition, it ignores movement, impediments, and damage from plants in the area that are neither magical nor creatures, including the thickets described above. The plants remove themselves from the dragon's path. So it's like a uber pass without trace. Like they could just move through their own turf without taking any damage or messing up the camouflage and the, the difficult terrain. And then it just resets itself, which is just amazing, right? So you create these environmental challenges just to get to the dragon. That's, that's the key to weaving a challenging adventure is using these elements. Um, the last one's cool. Rodents and birds within one mile of the dragon's lair serve as the dragon's eyes and ears. Deer and other large game are strangely absent, hinting at the presence of an unnaturally hungry predator. So the fact that an older dragon can do that um, and, and spy effectively has a, a network of spies in its regional lair area is awesome. Uh, it, it allows you to... In a way, it's like the DM being able to cheat, quite frankly, right? Like, um, imagine your party's trying to make their way towards the lair, which they can't find, but they're, you know, they know the rough area and they're kind of going to investigate it and they're dealing with all these thorns and thickets and, you know, difficult terrain. And like, while they're caught up in all that mess, there's little birds and mice and, and you know, every number of small creature that's reporting back to let the dragon know what's up, right? Now, if you wanted to be cruel, the dragon could just fly up over and just poison, spread, like just napalm the area that they're in. Napalm's fire, but you know, uh, Agent Orange, that's what I meant. Like just poison spray the hell out of that area, right? And then fly away. And then, you know, maybe the party recovers, maybe they die, I don't know. But like, when you're playing with dragons, death is a, almost a certainty, but you don't, as a DM, have to think of it as like, I'm going to be the dragon, I'm going to kill the party, because that's not fun for anybody. Think of this green dragon. This green dragon likes to toy with people. This green dragon likes to mess with people and delights in the suffering of other people. This green dragon might not even want to kill these people. This green dragon might want to just crush their morale and, and punish them so much that they want to give up and will plead for their lives in return for serving the green dragon. That's the kind of thing that a cruel, manipulative, evil green dragon would want to do. Let's take a look at stat blocks and powers. The green dragon wormling by itself is pretty fierce. AC 17, lots of hit points. Um, they're amphibious. They can breathe water and air, which you know, think about it, if you have a good forested area with a river, um, they can make their way up and down the river if it's deep enough, if they're small or if that river is deep enough. And then they could plop out, they could fly away, they can move through the, the woods, you know, however they need to. Um, but they're native to this kind of thing. They're, they're built for it, like literally in the description. Um, they're, they're coloring. Green dragons, the wormlings, have darker green scales, almost to the point where they're black. As they get older, it becomes like emerald and olive green, and it kind of helps them blend in. They're almost camouflaged. Bite attack as a wormling does um, regular damage plus poison, um, and they have poison breath. So the wormling exhales poisonous gas in a 15-foot cone. Each character in that, or each creature in that area must make a DC 11 con save or take 66 poison damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. Um, let's look at the young green dragon. The young green dragon, slightly better armor class. So they go up to AC 18. 
Um, definitely more hit points. They go from 78 to 16 D10. So that's a big jump. Um, same kind of basic factors there in terms of, you know, slightly higher flight speed and land speed and swim speed because they're, you know, larger dragons and older. They have multi-attack bite and claw. All of that does lots of damage. Their poison breath is a 30-foot cone. So that doubles that. It's a DC 14 con save, so a harder con save to, to succeed on, and 12 D6 poison damage, so double. And that's just the young. But wait, there's more. The adult green dragon, this is where you start to get into that big power. AC 19, 18 D12 plus 90 hit points. Um, Actually, no. Their flight speed and their land speed and swim speed is the same as the young greens. Um, but they have legendary resistance. Like the other dragons at this age, they could just choose to succeed on a saving throw three times a day. Um, Multi-attacks that do more damage, their bites, their claws, and their tails. They have frightful presence. They have poison breath. Now here's where it gets crazy. 60 foot cone on the adult green dragon poison breath. 60 foot cone. That's just, oh, like if you have a, a party in marching order going through the forest and they're caught up in thickets and you blow down a 60 foot cone of poison, good luck, man. Um, and that recharges on a five and six. That's also a DC 18 con save now, so that's higher. And the damage is Cray. It's 16 D6 damage. So it goes from 12 D6 on the young to 16 D6 on the adult green. They also have the three legendary actions. They can detect, they can do tail attacks, and they could do a wing attack. Um, kind of like the, the wing attack is, is one of those things that I think is really cool as an evasive maneuver where they just whoosh, they blow their wings into like a, a wind uh, blast that knocks people over and it buys them time to get out. Um, dragons, man. All right, last but not least, the ancient green dragon. Um, it's, it's just all sorts of pain. I mean, as a DM, I'm just gonna tell you this, just don't, don't put an ancient green dragon up against any party that's less than 15th level because the amount of pain and suffering caused by this is ridiculous. So armor class 21, you know, fine, whatever. Same swim and, and flight speeds and land speeds. Multi-attacks. The bites do a, a credible amount of damage. 2d10 plus 8 plus 3d6 poison damage for the bite. They have multi-attack. Um, the claws are ridiculous. The tail is ridiculous. Frightful, frightful presence. But here's where we get to just Agent Orange, right? Um, poison breath, 90 foot cone. 90 foot cone. So if you extrapolate a, fly, a dragon doing a strafing attack, right? Flying over a party that's on land, a 90 foot cone is a big swath of area. That's, that's crazy big. Each creature in that area must make a DC 22 con save, taking 22 D6 poison damage, or half as much on a failed save, uh, or, or half as much on a successful one. And then they get the legendary actions. And if you're dealing with them in their lair, they get all those other lair actions and regional effects that I mentioned before. So bottom line is the green dragon is a nasty, cruel, mean, mean creature. Um, and I don't think it's driven by ego in the same way as like a blue dragon. Um, if it's going to negotiate with people, it's going to make sure that it is in the dominant position and it is not nice. Like the blue dragon, you could kind of like pledge your allegiance to it and it'll like reward you as long as you kiss ass and like give it treasure and prove your worth, right? And it'll actually like reciprocate and treat you well and, and reward you. But the green dragon is just gonna use you up and spit you out. So um, yeah, green dragons, pretty fearful. 
So go ahead and share your stories with Green Dragons. If you were a DM and you used them, how did you use them? Give us a little synopsis of the situation. And how did the party do against them? Was it a TPK? If you're a player and you've encountered Green Dragons, what was that experience like? Share all of your stories in the comments below. And in case I haven't mentioned it already, muchas gracias to all of my patrons on Patreon. If you want to continue to help support the channel and keep programs like this going, join us on Patreon. Every dollar counts. Um, but to all of you who are subscribers and fans, thank you guys so much and continue to spread the word and have fun gaming. Imagine a show like, uh, Dave, what was that movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger with the alien? A alien? Predator. Predator. That's what I was thinking of. Remember that movie? Mm. So, you know, imagine that, like, they're not invisible necessarily, but they blend in really well. So maybe spotting this dragon in its native area while it's camouflaged is a higher difficulty, you know, for the perception check. Um, what about the Terminator? The Terminator is a cyborg. Shut up. <laughs>